I'd like us, if we could, to look once more to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. I'm going to begin reading in verse 31, and I'm going to read into chapter 20, uh, down to verse 10. Uh, whether we will get that far is another question, but uh, at least that's what we'll do for, for our reading. And our subject today is very simple, death, burial, and resurrection, because we're going to be seeing the proof of the death of the Lord Jesus, and then his burial, and then uh, hopefully his glorious resurrection. So we'll begin in verse 31. It says, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. But these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, jo Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloth clothes uh, with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and, the other and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. And then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. We've been examining the events that took place uh, leading up to the death of the Lord Jesus and then his agony on the cross. And we saw last time that conclusion in a sense that uh, it says in verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And so we've considered uh, his sufferings on Calvary. And now we want to look at his death very specifically, just the evidence that he really did die. 
And uh, this is significant because there are some that would say, especially those of the Islamic uh, persuasion, uh, that the Lord Jesus wasn't really dead. He just swooned and then uh, kind of came back to life again and uh, marvelously came out of the, the tomb, but just as a mere man. And there's all kinds of theories concerning it. We want to just see how careful uh, the gospel writers were in proving that the Lord Jesus was really dead. And so it says in verse 31, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was a high day. Now, again, why was that Sabbath day? It was a high day because it's a Sabbath day that is during Passover week. It's during uh, what we would call the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's the Sabbath day preceding the Feast of first fruits. So it's a very significant Sabbath day. It's not just an ordinary Sabbath day. It's a very special one because there's a significance that all the Jews will be there for the festival that would follow it. And so they're very concerned. Uh, They don't want the, the Sabbath to be violated. They have no problem crucifying the Son of God, but they don't want the Sabbath violated. And we've seen this, uh, their adherence, as it were, to, to ritual, uh, but their, their lack of reality in understanding their own scriptures, and especially as pertained to their own Messiah. And so they, they had no problem in this uh, crooked trial that we've, we've witnessed and, and crucifying the Son of God, but they, they certainly do not want the body, uh, bodies left up. Uh, so that the Sabbath somehow is defiled. And so uh, because it was a preparation, the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath day was a high day. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And so they're asking Pilate to do this. And of course, this was a very um, cruel, uh, the whole aspect of crucifixion was cruel, but the uh, the execution squad would use a, a mallet and basically uh, just smash the kneecaps uh, of the, the victims who were hanging on the cross. And so it was just a final act of, of men's uh, cruelty uh, in this, uh, this awful way of dying. And, and so uh, that was the plan. But again, God was to overrule the plans of men. It says in verse 32, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and the other, which was crucified with him. Now, again, it's kind of remarkable, isn't it? Why did he do it like that? Why, you know, you would have thought he would start with one and then just work along the line. Next, next the Lord Jesus, and then finally the last one. But no, he does one on uh, one side of the cross, one on the other side of the cross, and passes by the Lord Jesus entirely. Now, why would he do that? That doesn't make any sense. If you Usually these Roman soldiers were pretty methodical. There would be one after another after another. But no, it says, then came the soldiers break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. And we already saw, John tells us, Jesus was in the midst. He was the, on the center cross. So why would they do that? It says, in verse 33, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. I want you just to think about this for a moment. First of all, these executioners were experienced and they knew a dead body when they saw one. And so their testimony is Jesus was dead already. There was no question in their minds, no need to smash his knees with a mallet because they, through observation and through much experience, knew what a dead body looked like. And they said, he is dead already. And so we're emphasizing this, that Jesus really did die. (laughs) We want to make sure that this comes across. He's dead. Uh, They recognized that he had died. And then notice, too, he says that uh, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. So there's lots of things we've got to consider here in these events. First of all, um, 
this idea of <laughs> not breaking the Lord Jesus' legs, there's a reason for that. And I want us to, to see that there are many scriptures that are going to come together in this, that these men didn't break his legs, and there's, there's biblical reason why they didn't. Let's go back to the first Passover in Exodus chapter 12. And we're actually, we're going back a long way in our Bibles, but we're actually going back 1,500 years beforehand. And in Exodus uh, chapter 12 and verse 46, speaking of the lamb, it says, In one house shall it be eaten, thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. So one of the things about the Passover lamb is that they were not to break its bones, okay? And here's Christ, our Passover, being sacrificed for us, and no bone was to be broken. Now, let's move forward to Psalm 22, and we're going to look at a couple of Psalms, Psalm 22. Now, this is going back a thousand years, so we're from the Passover lamb, we're moving forward 500 years. But as we're looking backwards from the cross, we're going back 1,000 years. To the Passover, we're going back 1,500 years. But Psalm 22, verse 16, it says, For dogs, a term for Gentiles, have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. So they can certainly uh, see his bones, tell all his bones because of the way that he's hanging there on that center cross. And again, this Psalm 22 was written prior to the invention of crucifixion as a means of execution. So he's surrounded by dogs, he's uh, the assembly of the wicked, that's uh, the uh, the the ju ju wicked uh, religious leaders of the day. Now look at Psalm 34, please. Psalm 34, verse 20. Psalm 34 and verse 20. It says, again, written a thousand years ago by David, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. And then uh, one more scripture that comes into bear here is in Zechariah chapter 12 in verse 10. And this is to do with the spear and his side. It says, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And so, you know, you kind of put this all together and you say, here in this moment, these, these godless uh, Roman soldiers who knew nothing of Jewish scripture are actually fulfilling scriptures that were written 1,500 years, 1,000 years, and 500 years beforehand, and they're oblivious of what they're doing. But God is using this <laughs> to prove the authenticity of his word. This is incredible. Uh, again, uh, people have done studies of the probability of all these things coming true. And, and I remember one guy talking about this, uh, a, a, a mathematician of some note, and, and basically what he said is if you filled the state of Texas with quarters and had one of them marked with an X, and, and then you gave a blind man uh, the task of finding that quarter, <laughs> the chances of him finding it, because Texas is a foot deep full of quarters, this is what he's saying, uh, the, uh, and if he was to find that quarter first pick, that would be the probability involved in all of these prophecies being fulfilled. In other words, it, it's totally unprobable that it would happen unless God 
had something to do with it. <laughs> and God did. And all of these details fit together so very beautifully. And so all of them were fulfilled in this event by these Gentile soldiers who knew and cared nothing of Scripture. And so it, it says <clears throat> they, the soldier with the spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. And there's a lot of discussion on the medical aspects of this. Uh, that really doesn't interest me too much. But what I want to say is this. It's interesting that Adam's bride came out of his wounded side. And I do believe that the bride of the Lord Jesus came out from his wounded side as well. It's interesting, too, blood and water are often connected with birth. <laughs> and of course, our new birth is connected with looking on him whom he pierced in that blood and the water. And then blood and water, two aspects of salvation perhaps are brought before us. Uh, blood is connected with atonement. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so the atoning from guilt and then water is connected with washing away the stain of sin. And so blood and water coming out of his side, showing our, our atonement from guilt and our cleansing the stain of sin from us. And so, again, what a marvelous thing is brought before us in these simple verses. And again, John wants us to know these things. I want you to notice verse 35. He says, he that saw it bear record. And his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. So John obviously had taken Mary to his own home, and he had made his way back to the cross. And at the cross, he witnesses the soldier pierce the, the Lord Jesus' side. And he says, he that saw it bear record. That word means testify. Yeah, it's the idea of this, that I stand in court. I, I, I would swear in court that this is a true account of what happened. And notice he says, I bear record. His record is true. And he knoweth that he saith is true. He's kind of like piling it on, right? The record or testify or witness and true and true. And so he's just emphasizing this really happened and I really witnessed it. And of course, like the rest of the disciples, he was willing to lay down his life rather than deny what he had seen with his physical eyes and ultimately did die. And uh, so we, we just see uh, that uh, these men uh, had a tremendous conviction about what they saw. And then he says in verse 36, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And John wants us to know that. And we've, we've seen that. We've seen Exodus 12. We've seen uh, Psalm 34, Psalm 22. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Now, I want you to notice again the accuracy of the word of God. You see, a bone of him shall not be broken. He says that the scripture should be filled. But when he says in verse 37, another scripture say, saith, he doesn't say another scripture is fulfilled. It says another scripture saith. Because it, it's full implication of they shall look upon him whom they have pierced is yet still to be fulfilled. You see, that Zechariah 12 passage is still future, isn't it? It's when the Lord Jesus returns. It's when he comes back to the earth to uh, the Jews that in the tribulation period are about to be wiped out of the face of the earth. And a deliverer is going to come out of heaven. And it says, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they'll be born again. A nation will be born again in one day. And so, again, he's very careful. Another scripture saith. And there's a partial fulfillment of that scripture here. They're looking on him whom they've pierced. But the full fulfillment waits for another day when Jesus returns. And again, don't you just love 
the incredible accuracy of the word of God. If he'd have said, and another scripture is fulfilled, then maybe we wouldn't look at Zechariah 12 and look for a future fulfillment. But it, it says, but partial fulfillment, but not complete fulfillment. And so as we, we kind of wrap up this lovely little section, what we say is this, that John does not so much emphasize the violence of the cross, but the victory of the cross. The, the crying of victory, it is finished. The, the incredible um, victory of Christ's cry from the cross, the victory of fulfilled scripture, that's what he wants us to, to bring before us. Not so much the grief of Calvary, but the glory of it the glory of what's taking place here, even these Gentiles fulfilling uh, the, the word of God, not the tragedy, but the triumph. And so there's just, it's a tremendous way that John brings before us these glorious, glorious truths. And so we think now, we, we, we've seen very clearly that he died. The, Roman experienced soldiers know that he died. The very fact that they pierced him, blood and water came out, he died. He, he definitely died. And now we've got to think about his burial. And so it tells us in verse 38, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Because if Joseph had not have done this, uh, the, basically the body would have been thrown into a common grave. And that's just what would have happened. Uh, but again, God is intervening. The synoptic gospels talk about these men as very honorable men. Uh, they have some things to tell us about them. We want to uh, look at them. So let's look at, at Mark's gospel, chapter 15, as we think of Joseph, and then we'll think about Nicodemus. But, but Mark 15 and verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went to, in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And so, again, what a lovely description, an honorable counselor and somebody who's waiting for the kingdom of God, has this messianic expectation, this messianic hope. He's waiting for the coming of the kingdom of God. Earlier in John's gospel, John chapter 7, we saw Nicodemus when uh, they were ready to kill the Lord Jesus, even at that point. And in John 7, 50, it says, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our Lord judge any man before it hears him, and knoweth what he doeth? They answered and said to him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Every man went to his own house. So again, we see uh, even uh, Nicodemus standing up for him in a measure at that moment. And so these were, were honorable men waiting for the kingdom of God, obviously uh, men of, of great stature in many ways. And it is interesting that at his birth, there was a man called Joseph who was a poor man and yet willingly, as it were, bore reproach and was willing to identify with the child Jesus. Remember, Mary was with child while they were still betrothed and all the scandal and all the rest of it. And yet Joseph took him to his own home and raised him as his own child. So again, there's a Joseph at his birth, and now there's a Joseph at his death. And again, there's a reproach here. He's, he's been... Uh, crucified as a blasphemer as far as the Jews are concerned. And yet this rich man is willing to identify with the Lord Jesus in his death. And so these two Josephs, both men of sterling character, both willing to bear reproach and to be identified with the Lord Jesus. And they, they were courageous men. 
willing to own Christ when it was very unpopular to, to own Christ at this time. Remember, because of the hostility of the atmosphere, the mob uh, uh, is still around and all the rest of it. So Joseph uh, comes and asks for the body. Later on, we're going to see Nicodemus brings spices, uh, a large number. And so these men uh, were, <clears throat> in a sense, men of the hour who were prepared for this hour uh, to, to do this work. And so they were men of courage, and they contributed uh, greatly uh, to the Lord in the sense of uh, Joseph's own tomb was dedicated to the Lord. Uh, and so <clears throat> we, we read again in Matthew 27, Matthew 27, concerning this tomb where Jesus would be buried. It says in verse 60, uh, <clears throat> it says, and laid it, this is the body of Jesus, in his own new tomb, which he had you now in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. So it was Joseph's tomb. It was one that he had hewn out from the rock himself. A lot of work, a lot of preparation had gone in into this. And, and so, <clears throat> again, great preparation. Nicodemus, great prepara preparation. Uh, remember that um, the Passover uh, was not a day uh, to do business. So if he was going to have these spices prepared, and you notice verse 39, there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Uh, also the, the linen cloth uh, that they used. This all must have been bought ahead of time in order for them to, and, and even put in place in the tomb, because they knew they would not be able to do those things on the high holy day of Passover or on the Sabbath day, you see? So they, they, they're prepared in advance. They're, they're thinking about these things. Uh, they're, they they're obviously have paid attention to the Lord Jesus and his teaching. They've obviously uh, been conscious, perhaps, of Isaiah 53, and we're going to see that fulfilled again beautifully in a moment. But these men have put a lot of careful uh, preparation into this moment. And again, I want us to just see that God always has his, has, has his men at hand. Uh, men of the hour, men who were prepared for this hour. Prior to this, we, we read that they were secret disciples. We saw in verse 38, after this, Joseph Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Fear of man had kept them quiet. But there was a point when these secret disciples came out boldly and in the open for the Lord Jesus. And they were, they were willing to take risks. Uh, but they, they were willing to do it. They were men of the hour. And I can't help thinking, maybe because I'm just reading it in my own devotions at the moment, but I'm reading the book of Esther. And I can't help but think of the, connect, the, the similarity to Esther, because Esther spent a lot of her days as queen, uh, in a sense, as a secret Jew, right? She didn't, uh, nobody knew that her ancestry, that she was Jewish, and, and it was all kept very quiet. But there was a day when she came out boldly and she she recognized the risk and said if i perish i perish but she was somebody who recognized she was brought to the kingdom for such a time as this and when the time came she came out fully and came out boldly and we find joseph and nicodemus in the same way and so it does tell us it's possible to be a secret disciple. Now, it's not normal. We don't want to normalize this, but, but it's very possible to be a secret disciple. And yet there comes a time when it, they have to come out in the open, when their conscience will not allow them to stay silent any longer, and they have to come out publicly and own their Lord. 
And again, a challenge for all of us. Uh, let's, uh, we, we don't have any reason to be secret disciples and we need to get it out publicly whom we are and whom we serve and let everybody know. But they, in a sense, the fact that they had kept themselves hidden was perhaps a good thing in this case. So they had made them available for this particular hour. We said they, they, they'd searched the scriptures. They were obviously well prepared. They had thought about this. And I want you to look at Isaiah 53 for a moment. Isaiah 53 and verse 9. Isaiah 53 in verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And so he's crucified, as it were, between two thieves, the wicked, and yet here he is in his death with the rich. And of course, these... Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man, and uh, was there to provide so that he didn't have to go to a common grave. It, again, we find it, it's fascinating that um, Pilate gave permission for Joseph to have the body. And again, this would have been much to the to chagrin of the Jews. They would have been much happier for him to be thrown into a common grave like all criminals. And so this would have been very upsetting to them. And, and again, uh, his willingness to grant the body uh, was another way that scripture was fulfilled. Of course, here comes Nicodemus with his hundred pounds of spice. Uh, and notice it talks about the spices. Uh, it says he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, a hundred pound weight. Now, We've mentioned this, I think, before, but myrrh is very sticky and it sets like concrete. And so it tells us, and this is again, we, we can just imagine the, the care and the reverence with which all this is done. It says, Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths, clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And as we saw with Lazarus, they, they wound this around the body, but they put spices uh, in between each kind of layer. And as we said, this, this particular spice, myrrh was very sticky. And, and so it basically would set hard like concrete. And so basically that's what they're, they're doing. And notice, too, it says, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. And so this, what we call the garden tomb. It's very interesting, isn't it, concerning the Lord's trials. There, there's something of beauty even in the trials. Uh, for instance, Gethsemane was a garden, it was an olive garden where he agonized in prayer. And here, the garden tomb, even in his burial, there's something of beauty. And it's, I think there's something significant going on here, you see, because um, all our troubles began in a garden. The, the first sin occurred in a garden. And so the new creation, the old creation kind of began in a garden. The new creation, which is connected with the risen man, he's going to come out of a tomb, but where is that tomb? It's in a garden. And so this whole new creation is connected with a garden. This, this uh, second man, this last Adam, is going to come out of a garden. Uh, this, this risen man, as it were, uh, and a whole new creation is going to come as a result of this. And so, again, we just see how Scripture is all fits together so beautifully. And so this, what we might call this Eden was the garden of death, in a sense, that it, was, it, it, it resulted in a death sentence pr pronounced on the human race. And yet here, 
uh, we see this garden tomb in a sense is a garden of life because out of this garden tomb, the Lord Jesus is going to come forth alive and so uh, and, and begin this new creation, the first fruits of all that was yet to come. And so uh, a, a wonderful thing for us to consider these things. Notice, too, it tells us concerning this, uh, this garden, it says there was a new sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid. It is interesting, isn't it, that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt wherein never man sat. Uh, now uh, he's in a, a tomb where never man yet laid. And, and uh, of course, when he was born, he was in a womb that no <laughs> child had ever been in either. The virgin womb, the virgin tomb. Uh, just amazing, all of these things. And so it says, there laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And so <clears throat> the Lord Jesus would spend the Sabbath day, his body laying in the tomb in a garden. But we move on to the reality of resurrection. We've seen the Son of God dead, and we have seen him buried. And now John wants to see him gloriously risen. And we want to consider the, re the reality of resurrection. Now, many of you know I'm a, an avid reader of biographies. I love reading biographies. And of course, the gospel accounts are biographies of the Lord Jesus. And John's biography is very different from the other synoptics. We've observed that as we've gone through. And Christ's life is very different to every other biography that was ever written. Because normally, a biography ends with the person's death and burial. And you read about, I've just recently finished reading Martin Lloyd-Jones' two-volume biography, and it kind of ends with his funeral and the things that people said at his funeral, and that's the end of it, and the book's done. Whereas with the Lord Jesus, <laughs> his biography doesn't end at his death. The climax is yet to come. <laughs> and that's the most wonderful thing, isn't it? death and burial for him is not the end of the story. <clears throat> the glorious triumph over the tomb and the last enemy of death is the continuation of his story. And of course, how thankful we are because without resurrection, the consequences would have been absolutely a catastrophe. Uh, for all of us, there would be hopelessness We'd never know whether God accepted his payment if he was still in the tomb. But we know that God accepted that payment. He's raised again for our justification. We know that that payment has been fully accepted. So as we consider this account of his resurrection, let us not lose the wonder of it all. Try as it were, put yourself in the disciples' shoes or sandals, more precisely, and imagine you have lost someone who you have lived with and loved for the past three and a half years. You've been enthralled by his teaching. You've been amazed at his miracles. You, you've witnessed the demonstration of his marvelous power, and it all seems to have come to a sad, sorry ending. And so you decide to go and visit the tomb, and to your amazement, the tomb is open and empty. Imagine all of this. Notice it tells us, verse 1 of chapter 20, it's the first day of the week. The first day of the week cometh. Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. So it's a special day 
It's the first day of the week, but it's not just any first day of the week. It's the Feast of First Fruits. That's significant. We're going to see that as we go through this. Very, very significant. But it's the first day of the week. It's a special day, and there's a startling discovery. And it was a startling discovery. I don't think any of them anticipated because they weren't paying attention. I don't think any of them anticipated the tomb would be empty. And so what a discovery when they get there and see the tomb is empty. And then this, this chapter is going to end up with a significant decision. It's going to end with a, a, a monotheistic Jew called Thomas making an amazing pronouncement about the Lord Jesus. He's going to say this, my Lord and my God. That is a significant statement and decision. And so this is a wonderful, wonderful chapter. Not, not that chapter 19 wasn't a wonderful chapter or chapter 18 or any of them, but this is, a, is an amazing chapter. And so the first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early. Now, again, Mary from Magdala. Uh, it was an obscure little village near Cana in Galilee. And it's interesting how many people God uses from obscure places, uh, often despised places to accomplish his purposes. Mary of Nazareth, Mary of Bethany, Mary of Magdala. All of these were, uh, they're, they're famous places now, but in the day, this day, they were places of obscurity, not kind of a place that anybody really wanted to identify from being from. They weren't exactly the places where movers and shakers lived. And yet these people that God uses are from obscure places. Mary Magdalene was very, very devoted to the Lord Jesus. And part of the reason was that he had done so much for her. If you look back to Luke's gospel, chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, you'll just see how much of a debt she owed to the Lord Jesus. It says, it came to pass. Uh, afterwards that he went throughout every city and village. This is verse one, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene out of whom went seven devils or demons and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward and Susanna and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. So we see that Mary owed a tremendous debt to the Lord Jesus. I, I can't imagine what it must have been like for her to live with seven demons in, inhabiting her. Uh, how miserable her experience. Every example we see in scripture of somebody who was demon possessed uh, was, there was never a, a good experience. It was all torment. And she had seven demons tormenting this dear woman and the Lord Jesus set her free. Of course, he came to set the captives free. But Mary, uh, it, if we talk about never getting over it, Mary never got over what the Lord did for her. And she showed tremendous devotion to him. And she supported him out of her substance, as did these other uh, dear sisters. And so such was her demo devotion to him, not only when he was living, but now in his death. She's the first uh, to head to the tomb early. And, and of course, she'd been forgiven much. She loved much. And I wonder, uh, is, how is our devotion to the Lord Jesus? Uh, could, could, would people describe us as being really devoted to Christ? And I wonder if, if there's a lack of devotion, it's because of a lack of understanding of the immense uh, liberty that the Lord has brought us into, the immense bondage he's delivered us out of. Whoever is, commits sin is the slave of sin. And we were enslaved, and yet the Lord has gloriously set us free. And so she never got past how much she owed to the Lord. She lingered at the cross. 
she saw him laid in the tomb and was there again very early the next morning. And, of course, he gives us some additional details, John, about the tomb. Notice he, he mentions in verse 1, uh, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene earlier, when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Others tell us it was rolled away, but John uses a different language. He, he says it was taken away. It literally means to bear away, to lift out. And so the idea is this. Not only was it, because you, you see these, these tombs, and they would have kind of a, a trench, and the, the stone would roll down the trench and cover the mouth of the tomb. But what he's telling us is, not only was it rolled away, rolled backwards, it was taken out. It wasn't even in the trench. It was completely taken out so that the way was uh, open. And again, we have to remind ourselves, this taking away the stone was not to let Jesus out. It was to let the disciples in. It, he's going to come out of the grave clothes without any problem. They're all going to be left behind, as we're going to see, and he's going to come right through them. Later on, when the disciples are in the upper room and the doors are locked, he's going to walk right through it. He did not need that opening to get out of the tomb. It's open so that we can see in and see that it's empty. And so he wants us to know that, that a new day has dawned. A new way of God with men altogether has been opened. It's the end of Jewish things and the bringing in of a new life, a resurrection life connected with the Lord Jesus. I want us to just notice this. He talks about the first day of the week. I want you just to look at Matthew's account just for a moment. Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. End of the Sabbath, dawning towards the first day of the week. Look at Mark's gospel, chapter 16, in verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, what well, you just to, to see these, these little statements. The end of the Sabbath, the Sabbath is past. The Sabbath is connected with the old creation, right? But now we're on different ground. We're on the first day of the week, which is connected with the new creation. And we've got to see this. The old creation is giving way to a new order, to a new creation based on resurrection life. Old creation, old Sabbath, it's ended. It's the end of the Sabbath. That's why we don't keep this, the Jewish Sabbath, not just because we're not Jews, but because we're a different people. We're a people who are connected with a risen man. And we have a different day, the first day of the week, resurrection day, when Jesus rose victorious from the, the grave. So John tells us the first day of the week, Sunday, the Sabbath is ended in more ways than one. It's signaling the end of the old creation, the beginning of the new creation based on the risen man. The perfection of God's timetable. God is so meticulous about details. Uh, the timing of all these things. Notice, too, we said women first at the tomb, first to see the risen Christ. And yet it's very fascinating that when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul is marshalling evidence for resurrection, he never ever mentions the women in his arguments of who the Lord appeared to. And there's a reason for that. And that was that men were the only ones who their testimony was legally accepted at that time. 
and he's doing it like a court case. And he's marshalling the witnesses at that time that would have credibility. And so they're not mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, but they're mentioned here. And so it says, she, she seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. So when she saw the stone was taken away, uh, she didn't look in. In her distress, she ran to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple, who we assume to be John, the gospel writer. And her immediate thought is somebody, the enemies of the Lord, have stolen the body. It's bad enough what they've already done to him. And now on top of it all, this has occurred. And so again, for all Mary's devotion to the Lord, she mustn't have been paying attention to him when he repeatedly said that he would be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and rise again the third day. It's amazing how many times he said it and how few people actually paid attention to what he said, even the ones who were most devoted to him. And as we've said earlier in our study of the gospel, it almost seems like the only one who was really paying attention was Mary of Bethany, and, and maybe we could say now uh, uh, Nicodemus and Joseph, we're not sure. They certainly knew that he was going to die for sure. But anyway, very few really were paying attention. And uh, <laughs> of course, the fact of stealing the body was a reasonable assumption. Uh, they would have given anything to produce the body in prove that Jesus was a deceiver and a false prophet because they had remembered that he had said, destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it up. Isn't that an interesting thing? And we, we, our time has gone. We need to finish here. But isn't it interesting that the enemies of the Lord remembered clearly that he said he'd rise again. But the disciples weren't paying attention. <laughs> that's kind of amazing, isn't it? They knew it because they that's why they wanted a guard, because the deceiver said he'd rise again the third day. And yet the disciples, including the most devoted of them, had not paid attention. And that leaves it with a good place to end. Are we paying attention? I, I'm sure we believe we're devoted to the Lord. We love him dearly. But are we really paying attention to what he says? <laughs> Lord, help us to be those that really pay attention, that have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. So may God encourage us with these thoughts. Hope we'd got further, but 